Why don't we go ahead and get started? Thanks for joining us today. I'm Cliff Lynch. I'm the director of the Coalition for Networked Information, and I will be moderating the session. Uh, the session is one of the plenary panels that is part of the CNI Spring 2021 virtual meeting. Uh, we'll be doing plenary sessions for the uh, next uh, two days, and I hope you'll be able to join us for many of them. Um, these will conclude the meeting, which uh, began last week with the release of a lot of pre-recorded um, uh, project briefings and um, also uh, a number of synchronous project briefing sessions. Like all of our sessions at this meeting, this is being recorded and it will subsequently be available to the public when the meeting is over. There are a couple of mechanical things I'll just mention. Um, uh, we're gonna do this as a, a panel. I have a number of questions to ask our panelists who I'll introduce in a moment. Um, we have a Q and A tool and Please feel free to add your own questions using that or using the chat as the conversation goes along. Um, for about the last uh, 15 minutes of the session, I will open it up to uh, questions from the audience and we will try and answer those that come in via the Q&A or the chat. Um, I can also, uh, if you wanna ask a complicated question by voice, um, uh, make that happen as well if you uh, let me know um, or raise your hand. I think, oh, um, I should also mention that the, there is closed captioning available and do please turn that on if it's helpful to you. So we have a wonderful panel today um, that is going to be helping us to understand various aspects of a very striking recent announcement. Um, the Big Ten Academic Alliance is an organization of major universities with a long, uh, rich history of collaboration. Um, they made an announcement um, uh, not too long ago that they were going to sort of take the next step on this and start thinking about how to manage their library collections as a big unified collection. There are a number of aspects of this that are really fascinating. Um, I didn't want to spend all of our time reviewing the announcement and the strategy, but really to try and get at these aspects. I do want to note that um, Morris York, one of our panelists today and the director of the um, Big Ten Academic Alliance, um, uh, has prepared a on-demand video that is part of the collection of on-demand videos we released, which will bring you up to date on this. And I hope many of you have had the, who were not otherwise familiar with this, have had the opportunity to view that video or read uh, some of the material at the BTAA um, uh, website. Joining Morris are Claire Stewart from the University of Nebraska, Chris Ellen Maloney from Rutgers, John Wilkin from the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana, and Joe Salem from Michigan State University, um, who are all part of the um, Alliance um, uh, Leadership and Brain Trust that are um, making this uh, project happen. And um, I think what I'd like to do is um, uh, maybe not spend a lot of time on the physical collection as a place to start, because in some sense that feels to me, and I'd, I'd actually welcome uh, um, either pushback or agreement on this. This feels to me as a bit of an extension of something we've, as a community, been moving towards in 
increments for some years um, in shared storage facilities, in um, reciprocal uh, expedited ILL agreements. If you look at the University of California, they came up with these regional storage facilities back in the, uh, those were conceptualized at the end of the 1970s. Um, so we have a lot of history of this with physical collections, although, You've certainly, I would say, been more aggressive than most. Um, what 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 really is striking to me is that you're trying to do this not just with physical collections, but with the digital collections that are going to be key to our future. Is it, 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 does that seem like a fair framing? I see them nodding. Good. Okay, so I'm not totally off base. And maybe the place I'd, I'd be interested in starting is with e-journals. Um, e-journal licenses um, are amazingly um, complicated to, um, to write even for a single institution, uh, a large single institution. Just figuring out you know, who they apply to and who they don't, um, the terms of access, all of that um, can be a very protracted and tiresome negotiation. Um, how are you thinking about managing this for the entire alliance? And um, how, 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 what, what's, what's your mechanism for getting it done? You, there are so, so many uh, cuts at this. Um, I, I hope uh, my colleagues will jump in, uh, particularly Morris. But let me let me start with a little bit. Um, so I, I think on e-journals, we've we've uh, often seen this as a sort of a buying cooperative aspect of our of our work. Uh, I should say I, I'm John Wilkin uh, at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, um, and we've done that in the in the in the BTAA. We've done that buying cooperative uh, sort of thing. But, but that seems to us less compelling in some ways than what we might do in the future when we start thinking about our collective impact as a, as a group of institutions. So uh, for, for example, um, the publishing that happens across the, the BTAA uh, is uh, with some of the STEM publishers comparable to the publishing in the entirety of Germany. So, uh, so there's a, a you know a great deal of clout there, and so um, it, moving beyond the buying cooperative and what we might do and say a, a, a deal with with Wiley, which we've done in the past um, uh, for for uh, most of our institutions, are the things we can do in the in the realm of transformative agreements, where we start leveraging that uh, that uh, that that. Uh, um, that collective strength of our institutions to begin to transform the landscape, to to move to uh, transformative agreements that that uh, that advance open access more significantly, that help to change the economics of the landscape. So, so I think we will continue to do uh, the the buying cooperative uh, uh, sort of thing, but but we'll look at possibility of what we might do with our our clout as a group of institutions to try to help uh, uh, um, the scholarly landscape more generally uh, by beginning to change some things. Um, Morris, is that uh, anything you want to add there? I, I think that it's a, um, just an incredibly important, just strategically is that direction you're laying out there, John, to say it's a pivot from what we have been able to do in the past, which is focus on, you know, a wide variety of complex things, right? but if we were to boil it down and maybe oversimplify it, right, to say, how can we get the best, best deal for each of our institutions? And what the, the pivot, the shift here in strategic thinking, I think we could extend this to the big collection as a whole, is what strategic benefit can we join together to create for the alliance as a whole, for the common good of all institutions, rather than distinct individual advantage for each one, which becomes incredibly important in the journal licensing because 
and we say, what's the strategic intention? Do we say, are we trying to create a sustainable and scalable ecosystem for open knowledge and open scholarship for the Big Ten? It becomes a different question. And we say, how do we, might we join together to achieve that? And it doesn't preclude or um, necessarily set aside any of our strategies for how we join together in our licensing agreements and how we get good deal. All of that is still incredibly important. But it also, as we add to that, what's that central strategy that we can create that strengthens those individual strategies, but takes a new look at it and says, we're trying to achieve something different. And how might we join together in order to achieve that? And it presents a, a different question that we can hold in front of us. Yeah, I, I would only add that one of the potentials here, I, we have to do some discovery, right? But one of the potentials here is that, that even that buying club approach may change. Uh, licensing has to change. I mean, we have to have a real coordinated approach to what this can look like. But, but right now, our model is to have uh, duplicated collections across the Big Ten in a buying club, um, for, even for digital content. It might be in the ultimate analysis that that is the most efficient way to go for those things that we have to license, but uh, we might move to a, a model where we're able to get more rights to license and share digital content and kind of divvy up more of the publications and, and across the Big Ten have wider coverage or, or share those resources more efficiently. Um, so uh, I think the potential is there to be able to supplement, move from a duplicated model to a much more of a supplemental model. And I think that's pretty exciting as well. Yeah, I want to come back and explore that sort of if efficient sharing versus um, duplication um, uh, issue. Um, but before, because I think that's really key, and it's been very hard to achieve in the digital world. Um, uh, you know, the, the license agreements have tended to militate against it. But before we go there, um, so obviously transformative agreements are on the agenda here. Um, uh, and, you know, I think that's wonderful. Um, it turns out, or it, it seems to me to be the case that there is not universal agreement about what the goals of those transformative agreements should be. Um, and in fact, I've seen, recently uh, a fair amount of debate about that. I wonder if uh, one of you could share what you see as the key goals that the Alliance is trying to pursue in those transformative agreements. Well, I, th I, th I think that's absolutely right, Cliff. And uh, if for those who have had time to take a look at the video that Morris produced, I think the innovation model that we have centered with this um, really is important when it comes to looking at transforming journal licensing, transforming digital monograph licensing for that matter. And I think we're we're sort of uh, omnivorous and exogenous when we think about how to approach this. It's not just one model and it can't be just one model. Um, so, so at the same time that we're thinking about this knowledge commons and what it means to license digital journals, we also want to make sure that we're continuing our investment in open publishing infrastructure. Um, so I think, uh, not to completely dodge your question, but it isn't so much about what we're trying to get out of the, that one subset of activities, but really what we're trying to achieve uh, through the combination and the synergy um, amongst all of them. So we're, we're working with California Digital Library uh, on some of the data analysis around transformative agreements. But I think the partnership also that th through the Association of Research Libraries, where we have a much larger focus on some of the major, I mean, we've just talked about the, the limiting factors that we have with electronic licenses. That's a box that we're all in that is always going to be a huge limitation. So part of this also has to be engaging with that those kind of legislative solutions and really looking beyond, like t trying to think about a future where maybe we are not giving up our digital rights as we sign these licenses and trying to plan the things that we're doing now so that when we get to that point, um, you know, we're all pistons firing and really ready to go, go fast. 
I might add to that as well that the, 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 I think the question is a perfect one and, and particularly one to reflect deeply on for uh, each group, each alliance, each consortia, each individual institution that enters into this to say, what are our goals? What are we forwarding? What are our values? And how might we manifest those in the agreements? Because it is more complex than just getting a good economic deal, right? And, and um, a certain set of transformative agreements happened in Europe that gave a certain cast to even just the phrase, is that what we're trying to achieve? Does it have a negative or a positive connotation for our stakeholders? And how might we want to rephrase that? Uh, a, another phrase we've started using is sustainable publishing. You know, and how do we hold that up against transformative agreements and how do those two things interact and how might we forward that definition? Um, what the BTA is going to do is not what Germany did. It's not what CDL is doing right now. It's a distinct strategic direction that really fits our context and our goals. Um, and some of the deep reflection we've done over the, just frankly, over the last six months is in that very question is what are the things that we're trying to bring forward and what are we trying to manifest in those agreements so that we can do it with great intention. Um, and so we can communicate with publishers about what's really important to us and what we'd like to see um, coming our way as well. Now, my recollection is that you have already announced one of these agreements. Uh, yes, we've announced a, an agreement with PLOS um, uh, as part of their community action uh, program. Uh, we announced an agreement with uh, Cambridge University Press um, and there was a related, uh, so to this may be one aspect of getting uh, your question, a related um, uh, component. In, so there is investments in open access agreements as well as open infrastructure. So we also announced a collective action agreement with the director of open access journals, uh, all, all 15 of the alliance uh, supporting the OAJ as well. So there's a, a combination of moves that, uh, that are sort of, they're strategic, they're not throwing off uh, random events. They're sort of, we're intentionally building a strategy that moves across several different areas. So, yeah. Wonderful. Um, I guess while we're, while we're on these kinds of strategy areas, certainly I believe that a number of your um, members um, in the Alliance have either substantial university presses who are doing interesting digital things or um, uh, possibly in addition, um, library publishing programs that are doing interesting things. Are there plans to try and coordinate those more closely as part of this effort? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there are some interesting conversations already taking place between the libraries and the presses. And as you said, in some cases, those are have the same, um, uh, you know, the dean and the director overseeing both. Um, I, I think it's really much too early to say where that's going to take us. But I, but it, is, but I think it's a great example of you know what Morris was talking about. This isn't. This isn't a one thing or the other. This is a yes and. It's both, and it, and it's about deepening and connecting those investments in a in a really intentional way. Interesting. I, I look forward to seeing the developments there. I mean, um, one of the things that is perpetually striking to me is that. Um, it, it, there are there there feel like there should be a lot more economies of scale around university presses, um, uh, but the 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 way they've sort of propagated has been very resistant to that. Um, I mean, I think one of the op opportunities we have not only with um, so many of the presses in the Big Ten either reporting to or or having uh, library publishing at, in the libraries. And relationships there is bringing them to the table, right? I think this is a really great opportunity for us. And so uh, it's still early days in what that looks like. Um, and I think uh, the pandemic has been interesting for presses. It's actually bought a little bit of time seemingly for most presses to, um, to not have to, uh, uh, they're having a little bit of a boom from what I can tell, at least ours is uh, locally at MSU. And I don't think that's unique to MSU. And so 
it may delay some of that conversation, but I think we're all um, having the sand shift a bit underneath us. And so bringing them to the table, I think it could be a good model for more library and press partnership, even beyond the Big Ten. So can, can you say a little bit about how you're thinking about dealing with eBooks as opposed to journals? Um, and, and maybe as part of that, um, uh, cycle back a little bit to that sharing versus duplication theme. Um, and I might just jump in quickly on Cliff there. And, and um, Chris Allen, I think this has, a, I have relied greatly on Chris on you for great insight into this area. Just to connect to your earlier question, uh, Cliff, of uh, the, uh, um, things that we've been exploring and agreements that we've announced. And one of those that we talked about the journal agreements, one of those that uh, the Big Ten started together well over a year ago with, with, with Oxford Unity Press and looking at perspective uh, publishing and e accessibility to eBooks and uh, of the output of Oxford Unity Press as an example to say, how might we start to see these kind of agreements to find what works and then to be able to take those to scale, which is really what the Big Ten Academic Alliance does really well is scale. So um, we're very much starting those explorations as an incredibly important uh, component. But um, Chris, you've been watching this closely. <laughs> well, yeah, and that kind of feeds into sort of the broader fulfillment issues that we're facing and how we're thinking about that. And it's actually what we're trying to do, and it is about scale. We're trying to look at, you know, what would it take to make a make architectures that would allow us to do this? It's it's um, not going to be one single architecture. So we all have to work together. And what we're looking at now are the pinch points. And as we start working through the issues that we're facing, we're finding out, you know, with working with our folks in ILL and others and with the licensing folks, um, what works and what doesn't and where we need to build additional infrastructure. So we're being um, very deliberate about what we think we need to do, what kind of services we may need to expose, you know, and how we might be able to, and we, you know, licenses, of course, are the big deal here. How do we all know what each other have licensed? And we, we've we been all negotiating great licenses that allow for sharing, but we haven't really been able to operationalize that sharing because the people who are doing the work actually don't have the access to everything that they need to have access to. So. Right, I, I do want to circle back to that whole issue of infrastructure um, uh, in a couple of minutes because that, I mean, when I when I read the announcement on this, that was one of the things I started thinking about and my head started to hurt. Um, uh, the, the scale of the infrastructure challenge here is, is quite um, impressive, um, but before we get off of content, I want to ask about uh, two other things. Um, one is um, uh, audiovisual material, and um, what 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 your thinking is about how to deal with that, and whether you have any optimism we can get to sane uh, agreements on some of this. I mean, um, this is this certainly in the pandemic has emerged as a massive pain point. Um, and uh, um, depending on your strategy for sharing it, um, uh, it may be, a, it may continue to be. Um, so I, I was curious whether anybody wanted to add anything on that. Yeah, so I, in an earlier life, I was an, a media librarian, and this has always been a terribly messy area. I mean, you didn't even have to get into digital before you had a huge mess in this area, the way distribution agreements were written mm -hmm. and um, the very, very large community of distributors and producers and uh, just the, the rights complexity. I, I, I don't think we have obviously have any specific solutions. This is a great example of where, um, both because it's an enormously expensive to I mean, you could not, you probably could not pick a more at risk collection than the things that we have, particularly that magnetic media. So it's ripe for um, collective action and collective investment, just if we wanted to address the, the physical. And we've got one of the best of the best in the country within the Big Ten at Indiana with a major digital preservation initiative, which is, I think, a huge leg up for us. 
Um, but I think that whole patchwork of licensing is just another great example of where we, we just can't wait for the solution to come or to assume that we will be able to negotiate a license that will fix this. I think we have to also think about the solution coming outside of licensing um, and maybe asserting our rights in a different way. And again, um, pandemic, and, and there are a lot of li research libraries that have been doing this in ways big and small, not always very publicly. Um, and, uh, and But we are kind of having our moment now with the pandemic and the way that we've responded to making that, uh, you know, taking a different approach to providing access to the, the digital surrogates of our print collection. Um, we may be poised to do something similar, I think, with, uh, with the audiovisual material, but um, I, I personally just don't think we're going to buy, buy or license our way out of that. I just, it just, um, it just, it, it's, if anything, it's getting more dysfunctional um, and, and complicated. Well, it would sure be a wonderful thing if you could, uh, you know, blaze a trail forward for um, the research library community in this area, because I, I really think your analysis, Claire, is um, unfortunately all too accurate. Um, can can someone? Um, I I I guess I was. Uh, I would presume um, that you are also talking about how to capitalize on some of that expertise in digital preservation around this kind of material um, uh, in a in a unified way as well. I mean, you have got some of the major, you know, uh, centers in the country. Yeah, it hasn't been a key focus just within the last year, but. Um, I don't know, Morris, if you want to talk about kind of where we are with encouraging pilot projects, because I really think, um, you know, there, nothing has been set in, in stone at this point in terms of what we're going to be working on in the immediate. Yeah, absolutely. And, I, you know, I think to that point, we're going to um, start to be able to, you know, Cliff, as you started this, we're sort of just at the beginning of moving into action on this and announcing the steps and we'll see it. A number uh, over the over the coming months um, in the in the course of the year announcements of the pilots and where we're starting and we do have to have a certain focus with some of the major key challenges and then we start to expand the set of pilots and the move. Um, I, I uh, in a certain way um, come out of digital preservation <laughs> most recently, so it's near and dear to my heart. Um, we do have a, a, an incredible opportunity and, and particularly with the pandemic rapidly accelerating the thinking. Uh, uh, about action that connects across many of these different fields. So with digital preservation, for example, how does that uh, connect to um, the fulfillment question and when scholars can't actually reach the archives and when the stacks are closed and we're creating on-demand um, uh, surrogates of our collections and when those are the special collections and, and distinctive and unique collections and we're creating those digital surrogates, are we doing it in a way that produces high quality, high resolution, long-term archival versions of those? And then where do we store those? Are we each having to produce our own digital preservation infrastructure? Or is there some infrastructure that we can create collectively? And then workflows that are feeding in those relationships between on-demand fulfillment, deep scholarship and research, long-term preservation, the expansions of our collections. Um, I think what the big collection as a strategic direction uh, gives us is the opportunity to look across many of these areas that could be seen as distinct or needing development in each one and to really say, how do they connect and what are those threads that we can build in from the front? And not that we have to make a solution to all of it all at once, but if we enter into it with intention and working on these parallel um, trajectories that we can intentionally weave them together as we go and start to create things where we say, ah, we might not be working on digital preservation up front, right? We might not have a thing that says, well, we're going to do for digital preservation. But as we're doing these other ones, we start to weave them in. And then six months, a year down the road, a uh, year and a half down the road, we say, oh, yeah, we were working on that all the time. <laughs> we were building it, the basics into every move that we made so that it was ready, you know. One of the things I would add is um, obviously there's a huge infrastructure piece there for digital preservation, but I think one of the, the um, real benefits of thinking at this scale across the Big Ten is there's obviously policy and service um, aspects of things like digital preservation. And so 
the more that we're tapping into and leveraging the expertise across these institutions with varying, um, we're all on a different part of the spectrum as far as where we are on our own digital preservation um, strategies and infrastructure. Uh, but there's a lot of expertise and a lot of experience here. And so being able to do that uh, at scale across the Big Ten is where I think the, the real benefit of working in this way is. And it's, it's a slight tangent in a way, but um, I think it's worth mentioning that the BTAA were really leaders in um, developing the principles and protocols for um, interlibrary loan of special collections materials. So this isn't necessarily preservation, but this is big infrastructure. When you start thinking about how do you get people to make agreements so that they can take the things that are most cherished to them and figure out ways that they can share them. So I think the not looking at technical infrastructure, just looking at the way that the BTA approaches these things is really important. Yeah, and that special collections, um, uh, sharing thing was really a landmark. Um, I, I, I was really excited when I saw that. Um, let's talk about infrastructure though, a little bit and systems kinds of things. Now, I, I haven't checked, but I'm pretty sure that not all of your members are running the same platforms. No, no, not at all. I mean, I think you, we all talked a little bit or you talked a little bit about um, how complex jaw dropping or you know, overwhelming it is. And people might've watched um, Morris's video, but just a little bit more context. Um, the, you know, B, the BTA is a big research enterprise. It has over $10 billion in combined research expenditures. And I'm gonna drop some names here, but it's important. That exceeds the research expenditures of um, the University of California system and the Ivy League combined. And so collectively, the BTA produces 15% of the research publications in the, in the United States. Um, in addition to the research for a big educational enterprise, uh, more than half a million students are enrolled right now. So that's three times the number that are enrolled at UC. So it sounds like I'm trying to compete with UC, but what we've seen is the real transform, transformation the UC system has been able to make because of success, successful negotiation with Elsevier. And it demonstrates the influence that the size, when, when you have this kind of size, they can have in um, attempting to change or establish a, a new infrastructure. Even if we don't agree, everybody agrees specifically with what you see what happened with UC and Elsevier, I think we can all agree that it was a sea change and that it's gonna really change what goes on in the future. So when you look at the ETA, BTAA and realize that's only part of the story because our, our system you borrow, that's the resource sharing platform that we all share. Um, it accounts for less than 50% of all of the ILL activity within the BTAA. So you have that complexity, well, Adding to that, so, and because of that, and what that is, is most BTA members are large state schools, often the flagship of the state, and each has multiple adjacent networks like Ohio Link for Ohio State, Minitech for Minnesota, Palsy for both um, Penn State and Rutgers and so on. So these are networks where partner institutions may have different goals and priorities related to research and even a different emphasis on how they think about education, liberal education versus career pr preparation. So, you know, the issue is, is more than the BTAA. It's um, their, the full issue is the size of the BTA itself, schools with mostly sim similar characteristics, and then all of these adjacent heterogeneous networks that we also have to serve as part of our mission. So like we already said today, the size and complexity provide an environment where we can work at scale, hopefully like California with enough critical mass to establish and strengthen standards, set best practices for the market. And hopefully, you know, our partners or the market for library systems that are for-profit and not-for-profit and also with open source development. You know, Morris says we couldn't, issue an RFP um, and we couldn't even build a solution that would satisfy the requirements that we face. 
And even if we could, we wouldn't want to. Um, we don't want to create a big, giant BTAA silo. The vision of the collective collection is to pursue pur purposeful strategies of interdependence that will allow us to advance the missions of our universities, really advance public education, education at large. So our approach is really to um, integrate existing platforms and tools, produce a mo modular architecture, or as <laughs> Morris says, a kit of parts, um, focusing on key integration points, um, use standards-based interfaces, establish, perhaps develop a set of common services to link systems. So you asked about the systems that we use. If we look just at fulfillment, research sharing alone, um, we're talking about Ex Libra, Circe, Folio, WorldCat, Relay, Rapido, um, Iliad. So the goal, our goal is to really create in that iterative fashion an environment that allows us to expand choices by taking open approach that allows for system integration rather than just buying a, a big another silo. So that's our current, that's our approach to the architecture. We have multiple um, different um, pilot programs going on right now to kind of stretch where we are in that area. That, that's really helpful to understand, you know, that you're not, you're not just saying you're going to converge everybody to no. this a common giant platform in the sky. Yeah. Total non-starter. That will never happen. <laughs> but we do have the opportunity and now we've seen it. Now I feel just empowered because we've seen what working together can do. You know, we've seen that with what happened with UC, like I said, it may not be what we all want to do, but we, that changed. Um, what's going on with our, how we acquire our content for forever. If we could make some of those changes too with the infrastructure that we can all get behind, even if it's a commercial provider of a system, if those interfaces are so clear that we can interoperate, then commercial solutions may be appropriate. And, and open source may be appropriate. I would just uh, add that you're watching another, uh, I'll, kind of outside the libraries, but adjacent to, and, and Claire could speak to this with more experience because she's at a unit in school. I can't remember which ones are, but the units and models are moving more in this direction too. They've just added a second learning management system to their portfolio. And for a long time, it was the Canvas only for those institutions that were in units and they're moving to be not um, as platform specific. So I think this is the, it's good to see that elsewhere because it was, we were looking at models early on that was a question to us, you know, do we move in kind of a more of a unison type model where we all have shared infrastructure? We made that decision early on. And um, I, I think that was the right decision, but it's also good to see that, that decision kind of playing out elsewhere, that single platform um, consortia and models so it's just not gonna work for these big, um, these big institutions. That's really interesting. The, the, the last two sets of comments sort of foreshadowed um, uh, two questions I was going to ask. One um, was, for many of your institutions, you also play this flagship role within your state um, for the public institutions. And that, that sets up a really interesting set of, I don't want to call them competing demands, but um, uh, objectives that need to be balanced in some fashion. I think you called it adjacent networks, um, which maybe is a very good term for it. It was um, just to give credit where credit's due. It comes from the OCLC report that, so that's when they did the analysis and we really came to understand how large the our adjacent networks were. I mean, how much a part of what we did, uh, you know, was within those adjacent networks, so. One of the hopes though, is that some of the innovation that we see overall is part of what, what, what we're doing with the big collection. Well, even if it, from a content perspective, you know, especially think some of the work we're seeing on transformative models, they don't work with some of our regional schools. Michigan State's in a, a regional consortium on CLS. And if we go in on a, on a transformative deal, we, we kind of blow it up for everyone. So we don't necessarily want to do that unless it's strategic and, and we're helping them from that perspective. 
but as we go further along, some of the infrastructure and some of the kind of innovation on interoperability may be something that benefits those, those networks as well. So we're hoping to be able to contribute in a couple of different directions, even if it's not necessarily from a content perspective. So then, then the other one I was going to touch on was um, you that a number of your your members, I believe, are involved with Unison, and several of them are not. And I'm wondering how you see. I mean, Unison has its own sort of strategies for for cooperation inside the Unison membership. Um, how do how do you see those two? The, the what you're doing and what the Unison consortium is doing, uh, playing off against each other. Well, I think there's a you know, as Joe said, there's a lot of similarities in the model and the approach, and we're happy to see more of them coming from the Unison side with, you know, commitments to multiple platforms. But uh, the idea behind Unison, I think, was always to, to, uh, to have a little bit more control and maybe even ownership in the educational space and to learn from some of the things that we, the painful lessons that we had learned on the research side of things. Um, and for that reason, I think libraries are, are, have always been, and I should say, from, from the very beginning with Unison, the, the members of the library groups were getting together and talking about, you know, content relay was what we called it at the time. How are we going to make sure that as you're building this extremely powerful uh, academy owned and controlled environment for supporting educational innovation that you're also connecting to this massive investment that we've made in content. And, you know, I would give Unison sort of mixed marks on that. I think they always recognized the libraries were a really important critical partner, um, but the attention was often kind of drawn, drawn elsewhere. On the other hand, there's a, a fantastic Pressbooks, you know, open OER publishing platform um, through Unison. Um, I think the, the thing that's always been frustrating for libraries is uh, our inability to communicate that what we are seeing with the inclusive access model is very much the same thing we were seeing with evolution of big deals and journal publishing on, on the, um, you know, the research material side and that there's reason to be very, very cautious about that model and to be um, investing as vigorously in the alternatives and making sure um, that you don't get you know, five years down the road and what was a really great, sweet intro deal now that they've achieved lock-in, the prices go up. Mm -hmm. um, so I think uh, there's been much, I think recently re renewed conversation between the Unison and the, um, the library community, which, I, which I'm really excited about. And I think that, that there's an order tool, you know, that's built to kind of be faculty facing the place where they acquire and assemble their content. Um, I think, I think we probably still have a lot to learn about how faculty actually really do do that. But to the extent that there's a place where that activity happens, I think there's recognition that the library and the you know, millions and millions of dollars that we're spending that content needs to be very well represented and, and centered too. So as for you know, some of us are Unison and some of us aren't Unison, it's, it's kind of the same th theme that we've been going over regardless of who participates in the immediate, we all learn something and it always adds to and kind of advance, sort of like leapfrogging your infrastructure, right? Mm -hmm. um, you, it might be Unison that spurs this little thing that then becomes part of the common infrastructure that then advances something else uh, in another location. So it doesn't always have to be um, all 15 institutions as active participants. That's 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 a very helpful way of thinking about it. I think. Um, oh gosh, I have a million more questions, but I think, in fairness to our audience, we should call for some questions from them. Um, so, the floor is open. Please use either the Q and A tool or the chat, or raise a hand if you prefer that. And while we're waiting for questions, Cliff, I might just uh, say to build on what your uh, excellent 
framing of unison there, Claire, and this question about uh, also our adjacent networks and things like that. Um, the, the beautiful thing about the Big Ten Academic Alliance and the institutions we have, they do not exist in a vacuum. We don't get to all 15 to say, well, what would the 15 of us like to do? We're all deeply involved in many different initiatives. Sometimes it's a few of us. Very rarely it's actually all of us, you know, except for things like Hathi Trust. And, you know, and even Hathi Trust, we point to, uh, John, I see the poster behind you there. So I also, but that, that in a certain way was born out of the Big Ten, but it was never a BGAA project. You know, it was two, two of our institutions got together and seeded that now to something that has grown to incredible world changing scale and well over 150 institutions. And these are the ways that we can take collective action and to focus our efforts and to say what are the different things we can see and to forward our priorities and our collective interests and the common good of the, all the institutions that we work with um, to say is it is it unison that we can enter into and join to scale is it happy trust is it a variety of other open initiatives where we join to scale and we find ways to really forward those goals on on behalf of a much broader alliance and, and ours as well, right? Uh, our institutions and the priorities of our alliance. So um, Unison is just a wonderful example of, of a similar theme, I think. Oh, okay. We have a question in and um, we have we have one of these pesky ambiguous acronyms. Um, the question, what other concrete ways are you working with CDL? Wouldn't that be a massive scale? What's the biggest risk to this direction that you are accounting for in your planning? And what's the biggest risk that you can't account for? And I am guessing CDL there means controlled digital lending, not the California Digital Library. But um, please correct us uh, um, if that's not right. So they're really sort of two questions. Oh, Cal California, thank you. <laughs> okay, so it's not, so it's, it's CDL. So, so those, really, <clears throat> those really are two separate questions then. Um, so I th the first question is what, what are you doing with California Digital Library? Morris, do you wanna talk about the data analysis uh, piece that we're doing with them? Um, yeah, I think that, and this goes to one of the ways you um, started the, this great conversation, Cliff, is with what are we doing in e-journals e and what we pick up as the BTA and so forth. Um, we've been working for some time now with California Digital Library, which has been um, really innovating uh, the question of how do we create a, a scalable OA strategy for North America? And I said, well, of course, there are focused on California and how to start those conversations with journal publishers. We talked about Elsevier. That's been one of the great outcomes of that. They've been working on this for some time. And um, seeing, following their lead to a certain extent, their, their expertise in this area, their real thought leadership, we say, how can we adopt and incorporate uh, some of what California, the model California has been innovating? What can we pick up from uh, Germany and what Wiley has done in Germany and so forth and start to combine these and form a BTAA focused strategy. And we've been working closely with um, CDL on that over, uh, I'd say the last, oh, I don't know how long, John, uh, well over a year at this point, probably, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, to set as real thought partners, both in their, their expertise with data analysis and how to dive into it, the kinds of questions they know how to ask, the kind of probing they know how to do, and then present uh, some of our perspectives and, and what we'd like to explore and have them say, okay, and how about this as well? So real thought partners and analysis partners and also strategic partners and, and how we join together to, to work in, in that space in particular. Yeah, it's just a, I'll add, and this is really not a substantive addition, uh, a very, very deep dive into the data. And I think a lot of what we do in this space when we're looking at publishing and, uh, and publishers um, it tends to be superficial and knee jerk. And we want to make sure that we have a, a, a sound grounding in, in, uh, in that and, and that it would help us to extrapolate models. And they've been uh, great, great partners in that. Um, if, if I may, I'd like to just, uh, because, because there was the possibility of controlled digital lending, uh, 
just to uh, force a small digression and, and bring in the, the Hadi Trust piece and, and to say that, you know, for us, uh, you know, across, it wasn't just the two institutions, the whole BTA is, a, along with California as a founder, this is a proto uh, big collection effort, the way we think of ourselves together. And, and um, we want to give props to, uh, uh, to Hadi Trust for what it did with, with the emergency temp temporary access service. But it, it does help us to stimulate thinking, right? So um, we are now accessing millions of volumes at e each or many of our institutions. But can we then start thinking about the way that we can use resource sharing within the consortium to give up lending to another institution, to do some load balancing, to take advantage of that infrastructure? Obviously, that's not in the cards uh, right now because this is just a moment in time with the pandemic. But but it does allow us to think uh, more creatively about that, um, that deep investment that we hold together and that we can see as a platform for understanding our collections and leveraging them. Ditto on uh, shared print. So as you said at the beginning, uh, Cliff, um, it, it is a sort of backward looking, but, but my, you know, we have not done uh, anything with, uh, with print monograph, uh, uh, print book uh, storage, and could we uh, leverage really firm commitments that we uh, um, that we uh, coordinate around that digital collection in a way that that begins to advance our interests in the shared uh, book storage arena, uh, where we've got a lot of waste and uh, and underserved populations. So can we can we do a lot more there? And we believe particularly in the BTA that we can, and we'd like to see some more action in, in that direction. So sorry to force that digression. But no, no, that's a, very, that's a very useful digression. And I really did not want to give short shrift to the print aspects of this, but I thought that it would be better to focus on the electronic ones simply because they are a lot more novel and less well explored. Um, why don't we take that question about risk? What what what's the big risk you're trying to plan for, and what's the you know sort of biggest risk you can't account for in your planning very well? I'll I'll start with one that I think we're trying to account for, but it's I think top of mind, especially for consortia right now, and that is the financial situation we're all in. So we're we're making commitments. Um, based on some constraints in our own staffing. And, and although we anticipate overall efficiencies down the line, this is not really a cost-saving measure. This is, we're, we're really thinking in terms of uh, impact and, and um, scale across the, the Big Ten. Um, I mean, there will be hopefully some efficiencies um, and that's how you gain, uh, raise the impact level. Uh, I think the risk that we're trying to mitigate is, is moving right away to this idea that this is going to solve any of our financial constraints in the short term um, and, and socializing it at our own institutions from that perspective, at least at my institution, some of the concern is, oh, well, this is how we um, work across the Big Ten to deal with our own budget issues. And, and um, we have to kind of accommodate that in some of our planning um, and a hard way to, to get a big initiative like this started in, in this kind of environment might also uh, create the opportunity for innovation but it's a hard environment to do that i think the you know the thing that's related and i think it's partially what you said jeff i mean joe, jeff, joe. <laughs> and you know and it but it has to do with the cultural change. So you know that sharing is already in the DNA of the Big Ten. So we did, you know, sharing special collections. That's a huge thing. But still the rapid, you know, who, when you talk about risk, we're living through a pandemic. So the rapid cultural change that's coming with the pandemic and, and how do we, how do we really quickly reorient our, our folks to see all of this, you know, in the same way that, we that we all see it, you know, that the leadership sees it, that a good portion of the the library see it. So I think we've taken really strong steps to mitigate that risk by having a lot of presentations. Since Morris has come, we've really um, we're pushing out a lot more information about what's really happening, the scope, the nature of what's happening. 
but it is, this is rapid change for higher education. Mm -hmm. It's something we've been planning. It's something that would have taken place. Those circles around would have gone at a certain pace. They're really going to be fast now. And how do we get our organizations not getting dizzy <laughs> seeing that go around like that? Yeah, I think it's such a wonderful, I love this, Chris, that the, the pandemic just changes everything, right? Just, even just the notion that we could plan for a specific risk and say that we're resilient against it. I mean, something will happen that nobody ever could have predicted. And hey, maybe something that started over a decade ago with no knowledge of something like a pandemic at all, like Hathi Trust might step in with the perfect, uh, at the perfect moment with just the right, you know, and nobody would have planned it that way. So that I, this is, you know, cost is one kind of risk. It's incredibly important right now. We have to be able to plan for it and incorporate it. But a public health crisis, infrastructure collapse, the political upheaval, climate crisis, and there's so many elements. But at a certain point, it is just really hard to know what the variables are, or which ones are interacting on each other, and to say, can we plan for each combination? And I think the stance we're taking with the big collection is to say, well, what collective action does is it prepares us and sets us on a pathway to be more resilient against an unpredictable future. And if we start to take that approach, and then when those events happen, we can say we, not necessarily that we planned for it or solved it, but we prepared ourselves and we have the solutions to step into that crisis and the answers will emerge from what we've been collectively creating together. And, and, and whether that works or not, I will give the testimony of all history perhaps to say whether or not, uh, but that's what we're gonna lean into. And that, I think that's the direction is, is sort of the beauty of this, what the, uh, the big collection is, is a commitment to pursue that direction and, and to discover it together. That's a wonderful way to tie this, this together and to deal with those unknown risks. I mean, <clears throat> enumerating them all in detail is unmanageable. Um, uh, probably hopeless, but this effort to, you know, create a pool of resilience um, uh, is, is, I think, a very promising one. And that, in a very real sense, is what this is about. Um, we, ha we are getting very close to time. Um, I've got I've got two more questions here. Um, one one maybe has a quick answer, which is that you know right now we're seeing um, licensed content being dealt with increasingly on a sort of consortial scale. Um, wh what what would be the next step up for that? I mean, in fact, we're seeing it done on a national scale in some countries. Certainly in the UK, there's a lot of content licensing that goes on on a national basis, for example. Um, uh, some of that's being done in Canada as well. Um, does, th does this ever move to, you know, literally an international kind of a scope thing? I might just, I, I think we, Cliff, the, just the, the quick touch on that would be, I almost, and I love the question, Dale, but it's like, this is global, you know? And I think the global movement towards OA, we can sort of just almost describe the arc of it over the last 20 years and to see how this movement has been moving. I mean, for the BTAA, one of the insights we get in diving into the data is that fully half of the content published across BTAA is open now. Is it the kind of open that we want? Do we want to do we want to shift it in a direction? What do we want to do with intention as we move into that? Are incredibly important questions, but I think it's been able to achieve that level because of this global movement uh, and because of in different regions of the globe, different countries, um, different areas are taking different strategies towards that. And it's an excellent question to ask: is like how do we assemble all of those regional strategies into a global movement and a, and a cohesive? A step forward. And there are wonderful organizations that are taking that up at a very deep level um, to say, how do we start to join those together into something that uh, coherently joins these pieces together at a global scale and to really move the, the dial in a significant way? 
So we are at time, in fact, we're a little past time. And I just want to give our panelists the opportunity to say a last few words um, if they wish to. Well, something that hasn't come up in the questions, Cliff, is to um, really just to mention that this is something that we are in conversation with our provosts about and we have the support of our provosts. And I think there's a lot of faculty excitement and interest about this too. So we are here representing the libraries, but we don't see this as a library uh, project exclusively. And I think some of the, the conversation we had about, um, about transforming scholarship uh, really depends on working with the date with our fellow deans, working with our provosts. And I think we're seeing very promising signals about, you know, shifting that whole conversation from being about buying and licensing stuff to, okay, how are we going to invest in this research enterprise and what does it look like in the future? Maybe that's a wonderful place to leave it. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm so glad you stressed that because there really is a whole, um, you know, big conversation to be had about how how does this connect up with faculty, with the re collective research enterprise, um, in, indeed, maybe even with instruction and moving instruction into a, you know, community mode more and less of a, every institution doing the same thing over and over again. Um, John. Yeah, I, um, I, I want to be careful not to leave our audience with the, the, the sense that we're uh, building uh, a fortress uh, in the BTAA. And I think you've heard this from uh, just about everybody on the panel. We think of ourselves in a larger context. And, and so just to, to remind everybody, Dale Askey's question toward the end is, is very helpful. And uh, Morris's response is, is right on target. Um, we're, we are not trying to, uh, to build a, a moat uh, around the BTAA, but really to see ourselves as uh, citizens in the world and try to find some extensible strategies that, that, uh, that tie us into that infrastructure. And we believe that we can do it by building in uh, on top of what we've committed with each other. So thank that, you. That's it. What, what a great pair of bookends to the panel. We thank you all so much for doing this and for making us all a bit more informed about the great stuff what you're doing. And I really hope we can get you all back um, uh, at some point in the future to see how this is evolving going forward. So many, many thanks for a great panel, folks. And Thank with you, that, I'll conclude the first day of plenary sessions, and I hope to see uh, many of you tomorrow at uh, 2 o'clock Eastern. Have a good evening, all, and thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm.